Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show with I, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 553, no, 554 actually, 554. 554, hope you're doing well wherever you are, wherever this is finding you, hope you're doing splendid and you're well and you're tight and you're smiling and you're happy and you're hydrated. I am too at the moment, I'm drinking a mug of coffee at the moment, feeling good, feeling well. I've obviously got my pump on at the moment, as you can tell. Look at those biceps, they're coming along really, really well. The tits still need some work, right? Because I need to get those down, but you know, that's a little bit of a harder job. You have to watch your diet, you've got to drink loads of water, do loads of cardio, and push-ups. I've realized there's no way to cheat um, to get your pecs looking nice and titty, then to actually do press ups, you have to do press ups, you have to do push ups, you can't just do bench presses, that's not enough. You can't do incline, you can't do flies, you gotta do a bit of push ups too. That kind of adds to give the overall um, denseness, I feel like, in it. So hopefully, I'll get there. Hopefully, I'll get there. I'll get that little chest that I need at the top. But yeah, it's coming along little by little, little by little, it's coming along. Still doing the fasting, still doing 75 hard, so that's going on pretty well. I'm on day eight at the moment, so looking, enjoying that and really, really looking forward to all those things going forward. And hopefully, by the time festival season comes around and I go to Houghton this year, I'll be looking tight, I'll be looking right, and I'll be ready to pump my fist in the air continuously, listening to the good old techno music. You know the deal, you know the deal. But yeah, many things to jump into to talk about today. I'm not going to waste too much of your time. I'm going to go right on into it and just, you know, dive in and talk about all these topics. Hopefully you enjoy, hopefully you like. And as per usual, you know, sit back and enjoy, in it? Sit back and enjoy. So first things first, I wanted to talk about that kind of bored my piss and something that got me a little bit riled. Probably shouldn't have because, you know, I should know better than to get riled about things that are not in my control. But hey, it's the internet. We have to waste some time. It's a pandemic. What can I do? So I stumbled across this post of Joe Budden on his Instagram stories where he posted this um, list. Well, no, yeah, he posted this list of the top 50 podcasts from quarter one, 2021 to quarter four, 2021. And it licks them in terms of like weekly listeners, right? And there's some, you know, interesting um, people on there. I didn't know Bill Burr's podcast was as popular as it was. Call her daddy still on there, like crazy stuff, right? Interesting. But interestingly enough, on the list is the Joe Budden podcast, right? And it's still there, number 37 in the top 50 lists, most listened podcasts in the US, which is a pretty decent achievement. And of course, Joe Budden in this kind of current form he's in at the moment, he's basically on a mission to prove everyone wrong because he feels as if like everybody counted him out when he decided to fire Rory and then Mal left the show. I think everyone was was probably right in their thinking to assume that because the show's success was mostly built on the back of their friendship, not just Joe, because even though, you know, he still fights against that, he still thinks he's the only one people come to tune into and listen to, which is not the the facts at all because even now with ice and ish there's fans of that show who are you know fans of those guys and can't wait to hear you know their opinion on certain topics so clearly they don't just come for him but again regardless we move on but he's on this one-man mission to prove his doubt was wrong that he could basically keep the show going to the level that it's at at the moment without the need of Rory Amal and that in the end, he was vindicated in the end, like he'd made the right decision, made the right choice, whatever, something along those kind of lines. Because I don't think I ever saw um, Joe share as many stats and achievements and numbers concerning the podcast before this. The only time I remember him doing that was when they were going through the Spotify negotiations and he was kind of being a little bit petty and basically throwing out the numbers as a kind of weird, indirect um, middle finger to Spotify because at the time, it basically felt like he wasn't getting the right or he, they didn't value his contribution um, to a level that he basically felt. Or maybe the numbers prove, I don't know, regardless. But now he's doing it really crazy. He's going on super hard and kind of posting these statistics and numbers. And he decided to post a screenshot of that list of um, podcasts. But I noticed that he actually changed the listing on one of them. Number 37 isn't listed like that on the, sh on the website. If you actually go to the website itself, what you will see is number 37 actually lists Rory Amal because obviously this is data taken from last year 2021 to the end of 2021 so that would include some of the podcasts that were that still had those guys on and obviously it would include a show when it was in that iteration with Rory Amal and for whatever reason um, Joe felt it necessary to photoshop their names out of that list 
and he ought to post it on his own page. And then on top of that, he also posted the following words. Independent, no backing, black owned, new co-hosts, no ads, no integration placed in the audio, opened the market, said no to the offers, staffed over 30 for a pandemic, no loans, no gimmicks, no guests, no handouts, just Joe. Some of y'all know who the fuck I am. Clearly dripping in narcissism and lacking in self-awareness because the whole point why he's here at the moment, that's the thing is what people don't understand about podcasts. I don't know if you guys care, but... I don't really care about numbers, as you guys can tell. Some of the topics I talk about don't bring in any numbers whatsoever, but it's stuff that I'm actually interested in and I would love to share with you guys. Hopefully you, you are interested in them in some regards. Sometimes you're not, but still, I think the whole point of having a podcast is to talk about things that you're passionate about and interested in. Just talking and covering the things in culture just because they're in culture makes no sense. I'm a cultural commentary podcast, but I like to comment on stuff in culture that I'm kind of familiar or kind of knowledgeable on so I can make it somewhat entertaining for my viewers whoever many they view they are that out there but i don't know if you guys know this but podcast numbers are somewhat fudged because if i'm not mistaken most of the podcast numbers get fed through apple and apple i think when you subscribe to a podcast and you change your phone you still have the same subscriptions on your phone but then when you open the, the app it sometimes will automatically download the podcast in the background. So you could have been subscribed to a podcast many, many years ago. You don't even listen to it anymore. And it could still be st downloading in the background without you knowing. So that will contribute to the numbers of downloads or whatever it may be. And sometimes you might open it and just play it a little bit and that will contribute to numbers. So numbers can get a little bit fudged sometimes, right? And obviously there's many fans that have been grandfathered in from the time that they started it. Um, even maybe when it was called, you know, I'll name this podcast later. So all those fans are basically from that. So that's what's contributing to what they're doing now. So it's pretty impossible. Again, Joe's a smart guy. He has, you know, interest. He can talk quite eloquently about things concerning hip hop and culture and whatnot. It would be a really hard job for him with the experience that he has to take a podcast that's already working and suddenly make it complete crap where it's not got any listeners and he's driven everyone away. That's not going to happen. He obviously did the whole freak out thing where he fired Rory on air and he started basically arguing back with fans online because he was just angry and upset. I think just freaking out. But also he maybe thought it was a weird way to kind of cleanse the fan base of the fans that weren't going to ride with him anyway so that when he re did relaunch the podcast, he could then, you know, ask them for more Patreon money, bring new co-hosts and they'll be down with it. Like he could basically, he would knew the, the people listening to it now are definitely the ones that are the true believers in Joe because if you're willing to stand up for Joe now off the back of him kind of scamming his friends, then you're most likely going to stick with him for the long term. You know I mean, you're never going to um, sway on that, on that regard. Whereas I did. You know I mean, I saw how he treated his friends and I was like, no, I can't co-sign this because he sold me a dream that he was one way. Then his closest people that he loved, he did them dirty the other way. Which brought me to another point. On his podcast, he actually um, had a bit of a rant concerning the Joe Rogan N-word controversy that's going on at the moment with Spotify. And he said something really interesting that I thought, again, was lacking in self-awareness because everything that he's basically accusing Spotify of and Daniel Elk, uh, Daniel Eck of, he could also be, someone could also say it could be attributed to Joe with how he treated Rory Omar. So this is a clip I'm going to play from the podcast. I'm just going to play off my phone because I can't bother to get up on the computer, but hopefully you can catch this. <clears throat> But back to my shock child point, which I would be considered as the second exclusive podcast there in a two year situation. We didn't say a thing that would get us canceled. True. It's the opposite. See, this story, this story goes deep. We didn't say shit. We only performed. No having it in. Get the fuck out. Wait, that's Rory Mo. Here's a, a zero 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 one percent percentage of whatever I think this is worth. You just said I'm a man. But then what you watch, <clears throat> you wait for the other black podcaster to get that to get that back. You wait for it. You know what I saw? I saw the two gay dudes get the podcast. Where'd it go? You never heard a peep. They just announced it. I never heard. Where, where'd it go? Cool. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, Girl. Will Smith. Michelle and Barack. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. Barack Obama. Barack Obama. That's where some of the anger comes in. But you got to put that to the side because work harder. But these are the black people that you have to be to get anywhere near worth from your company. 
that speaks to the value of your company. That represents the values of your company. What the fuck are we reading here? Let's go further. Rogan gets 100 mil, probably underpaid. Car Daddy started in 2018 and three years later got $60 million. For only a couple years, right? Fairly short contract. Yeah. yeah. They got a three year deal, right? Three year, 20 million a piece. 20 million a pop. $60 million. I know star tight ends that won't get it and don't get it. Just to put in place for you the pay scale out here. And that's not hate. I hope that don't sound like hate. Mm, that's just seems, that's just looking at what's going on. That's perspective and observation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I so think. I don't convince people, or I will I don't allow people to convince me of what their values are. Because I think I've been around long enough to tell sometimes. Mm. It's not in what you say. It's in how you treat people. Uh oh. All across the board. Uh oh. That's not just for Daniel Eck and Joe Rogan. That's for fucking. You could be on a date. I'm watching how you talking to the waiter or the waitress. How about Rory and Mo? How you talking to the cleaning staff? How about Rory and Mo? How do you view and treat people? How will you How will you go about it when the shoe is on your on your foot? And that for me is where the hypocrisy lies with Joe Budden. He speaks about feeling like he got mistreated by Spotify, which he might have, but I generally do think it's just a numbers game. Competing with Joe Rogan and Cooler Daddy is probably not the right competition. Those two podcasts, you know, do crazy numbers, especially Joe, Joe Rogan's podcast, considering the length of the flipping episodes. So to expect to get a deal anywhere near what he got was crazy. And if you remember, as a fan, Joe's mood entirely changed on the podcast as soon as he found out how much Joe Rogan was getting on that show or for his show when he joined Spotify. And I'm not even sure he really understood who Joe Rogan was at that time. He kind of had made he heard his name, but I don't think he actually knew how important or how popular or how well regarded or how, you know, how big his fan base was in general. He just assumed he was just a podcast guy like him. But Joe Rogan is more than that, which is explains why he's basically being excused for saying the N-word, which I think any other white celebrity did that. They'd probably be cancelled a long time ago. But basically Spotify are fighting for him because he's that valuable. So to compare Joe Budden podcast with Joe Rogan is crazy. To compare Joe Budden podcast with even Cool Daddy is also crazy, considering the demographic that it's serving. It just doesn't make any sense. But then the part about doing right by people when you when you're kind of in control when your when the shoes on your foot. This is why I don't have any time for all these people that complain about record labels and all that stuff. I don't have any time for it because what ends up happening, I feel like. Joe Biden for the longest time complained and moaned about record deals. He went on air and cried about De La Soul splits and was clearly passionate about how, you know, fugazi and corrupt and broken the music industry was. And it felt like, again, he never said this explicitly, but it felt like to me what they were doing as a group, sort of like an urban version of Entourage, was that they were trying to prove to the industry that you could do good business with your friends, that you could do rap by the people that came up with you. And that you could maybe set a new precedent going forward, kind of lead by example. So other podcasters, if they came behind you and got deals, they could look at you and say, oh my God, wow, Joe broke off some mad bread with these guys. He gave them more a bit of ownership, whatever it may be. They could use it as an example to basically do the same thing. So in the hope that by your actions and deeds, you could change the culture and the tradition and the way things go in the industry. But it didn't happen that way. Immediately when Joe got a bit of power and he got a bit of control and maybe you got the, you know, the car to the flipping um, bank account, whatever it may be, he suddenly turned into a tyrant. For, according to Rory and Moore, <clears throat> he was unwilling to give them accurate accounting. It seemed like he was probably unwilling to give them accurate data and numbers concerning the podcast, maybe kind of echoing and repeating the, the kind of um, the feedback he was given by Jay-Z when he tried to get the numbers from Tidal. Maybe, who knows? But it seems like all the wrongs that he was dealt with or he come across when he was in the music industry or even when he was trying to make it in podcasting or other platforms of entertainment or presenting, he then did the same thing to his own friends, 
which then obviously led to them splitting up and them setting up Rory and Marshall and, you know, Joe getting new co and Ice Ish, which, you know, for the most part, it seems like it's going well. I don't actually listen to the show anymore. I completely jumped off of it because, you know, it just annoys me too much to hear Joe Rogan, sorry, Joe Biden's voice and stuff, considering everything that's happened. And again, even the Rory and Marshall, even though it's improving, it's still not my kind of go-to podcast anymore. I think that original lineup is where the real magic is at. The ability to bring those two groups of people together in Rory and Mal and obviously in Joe Budden and the friends that he's able to bring really made that podcast special. The way that he was able to push them out of their comfort zone, you know, be vulnerable, talk about interesting things, talk about done things. That's what actually made that podcast legendary. And unfortunately, we don't have that anymore because Joe Budden was unw unwilling or unable to put his ego to one side, to put greed to one side, to put selfishness to one side and break his friends off a bit. And now that Spotify doing did the same thing to him, he's now complaining. Or now that Spotify are deciding to basically pitch their ride on the Joe Rogan wagon because he is a star quarterback. I'm sure if Tom Brady, again, God forbid, if Tom Brady, when he was playing, ran over a kid, he would probably still play. And we would all understand why. Because it's Tom fucking Brady. Same thing with this. It's Joe fucking Rogan. What did they expect would happen? Unless legitimately, I was thinking about it the other day, unless a story comes out that you know, during his time doing Muay Thai, when he used to travel to Thailand to go training, I don't, know, I don't know if this is true, I'm just making it up, that somehow during training camps, in, you know, in Thailand when he was doing Muay Thai, it was found that he had murdered like 17 local children or something and buried their bodies underneath some swimming pool. Maybe that would cause him some bother. Maybe. Just maybe. But if it's this foo-foo stuff like N-words and saying racy jokes or, you know, talking about trans athletes, and no one's going to care because he brings crazy amount of numbers. Just the acquisition of Joe Rogan Podcast alone has basically leapfrogged Spotify over Spotify, Spotify, Spotify over Apple Podcasts. They're the number one podcasting platform now at the moment. Number one. Crazy to think that, right? Considering the the musical heritage of Spotify, considering the amount of bands and artists that are on there, their crazy catalog, podcasting is actually the number one thing that they do now at the moment. Podcasting. Who would have guessed that a few years ago? Who would have guessed that? Crazy. So to expect them to kind of acquiesce and, you know, maybe treat you the same way they're going to treat, to, to, to treat Joe Budden the same way they're treating Joe Rogan is ridiculous. And also the last point to make on this as well is maybe a lot of it has to do with being likable. Maybe that has to do with a lot of it. Because I was thinking about it today, um, in part because of the screenshots everyone's sharing from Azalea Banks' Instagram stories, where she's basically saying, oh, um, some people get to make mistakes and I don't. I'm still having to kind of carry the burden of what I said or did when I was younger. And I think talk, basically talking in relation to Joe uh, Rogan, obviously using the N-word, and she was talking about how kind of unfairly she's treating the press. And I was like, she's obviously oversimplifying it and completely overlooking the part that she's played in this, Azalea Banks, who I'm a big fan of. She's just not an, un she's just a very unlikable person. Now, should be, the, I think what Joe Budden kind of is getting at a little bit, because I think he mentioned it about the cigarette stuff and that, when he's just smoking complex building, should being unlikable determine whether or not you get given deals if the numbers are right? No. In an ideal world, no. But we've seen now with Antonio Brown, supremely talented in, you know, in whatever position that he plays in. He's obviously somebody that people would want to have in their team because he's definitely going to allow you to have the possibility to go to the Super Bowl and maybe even win it. But he's so much hassle that even his supreme talent, God-given talent, that separates him from many, many men on this earth is not worth it. It's just not worth it. To franchises that want, haven't won a Super Bowl, it's not worth it to have someone like Antonio Brown in their team. They've even decided it. That happens in all forms of business, all forms of all walks of life. And I think Joe's maybe suffering from the consequences of it. And I don't think publicly beefing with your friends who you started a podcast with, firing one live on air and getting into a back and forth feud or arguing with fans online is going to change people's impression that you're not a likable person, which is why you don't get those deals. Joe, Joe Rogan, for, look, look how many people are coming out and basically defending Joe Rogan's right to say fucking nigger. Do you know what I mean? Like, because he's a nice guy. He's such a nice guy that people are willing to turn a blind eye to him saying nigger. That's how much of a nice guy he is. And I think for whatever reason, Joe Budden has kind of refused to kind of have that in his head. He just thinks, oh, you know, it was a conspiracy. They don't like black podcasts and stuff. We have no evidence that this is a fact. He's just kind of, again, pulling a race card for the sake of it. Who knows? It could be true, but we don't know. We, and we can't trust your opinion because you, you, you're not likable in the first place. So it kind of taints the entire negotiation process. And also, we don't know. 
even his own friends didn't know really what the ins and outs were of the negotiation process with, with Spotify. So from what we've been told, from what we kind of we've been told by them. So how much more for us? But yeah, it always it always riles me up. I shouldn't pay attention to it because I don't listen to the show anymore. But it is what it is, and it we move on. Next on the list, I think um, m- many of you guys have heard the news here in the UK that um, a football player called Kurt Zuma was v- uh, a video of him leaked. Actually, it wasn't so sort of secretly a video of him leaked where he's basically um, assaulting his cat and kicking it all over the kitchen and stuff and just being a bit of a lout. And um, everyone's obviously you know losing their shit over it, especially here in the UK. And it's funny because I'm just going to get it up on the screen here. It's interesting, not funny. It's interesting because it does seem like people are treating Kurt Zuma kicking his cat with way more severity than they are treating the instances of racial abuse that players suffer on the pitch in the UK on the regular basis. We just saw it on the weekend in the FA Cup. We saw a fan run into the run onto the pitch and punch a football player on the pitch. And who did he punch? Vis a vis a black player. So we've seen all these instances that happen and we also have instances where players are threatened to walk off the pitch if they get racial abuse in the stands and fans have basically said, no, we don't want to see that. We don't want our game to be ruined. They don't want to be inconvenienced. They think it doesn't, it sends the wrong message. You're letting the races win, play and stay on the pitch. So basically they're saying stay on the pitch so that you don't have to, um, the game doesn't have to be cancelled. They have to lose their, their weekend on the Saturdays. But when it comes to a cat, oh, oh, so I'm not going to play it because it's horrible. But I'm just going to show you the screen grabs. But when it comes to a player kicking a cat, which obviously is heinous because he has, literally has it in his hand, drops it and then kicks it across the flipping kitchen, right? Which is absolutely wild to see. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely nuts to see. But people are treating this with much more severity and way more seriousness than they would treat anything concerning racism in football. There's another video too, another part of the video where he kind of chases a cat around his kitchen and throws stuff at it, basically scaring it to death and whatnot. So clearly not the not the nicest guy to pets who you would seem, right? So that makes complete sense. But the funniest part about it, I thought, was the David Moyes interview. David Moyes is the manager of West Ham, who's obviously the, the manager of Kurt Zuma. And who also decided to pick Kurt Zuma in the game against Watford. So after the video came out, instead of dropping Kurt Zuma or basically, you know, whatever it may be, making up an excuse that he's injured, he started he decided to start him from the beginning because in his eyes, he's one of their best players. And I think what it highlights is the lack of morality and ethics in football. And the reason why I mention this is because I feel like a lot of fans have this naive view that somehow if a crime is heinous enough, then the club will do the moral thing and sack the player. Blah, blah, blah. It's never going to happen. Clubs are in it to win games. They're in it to kind of get fans in the stadium, get, get you know, have people pay for the tickets through the gates, buy merchandise, support the club, maybe get bonuses if they finish in certain league positions, blah, 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 blah. But they're in it for the glory. And whoever can help them in their pursuit of glory, they will sign them. We've heard already what happened with this player in Scotland called David Goodwillie or whatever his name is. He supposedly was convicted of rape and then kind of acquitted. And then he got charged, I think, in like a civil case. So basically, it's under no, we're under no kind of, um, we're under no kind of under doubt that he definitely did do the rape. But obviously, they couldn't prove it under reasonable doubt in the court. But he obviously was guilty of some sort of form of sexual assault. Maybe not the rape, but some form of sexual assault. Still, the club in um, Scotland decided to sign him against the advice of everybody, against the recommendation of everybody. They have a very popular women's team. They they obviously were kicking up a fuss about it. Like, sponsors were falling over the place, or falling left, right, and centre, and walking away from the club. And they still didn't want to let him go until the very last moment when it started to affect their bottom line. And, you know, fans were basically protesting and not turning up to the games. They suddenly did, they suddenly did the right thing and decided to basically suspend him with pay, which is crazy. Because it means they still get paid his salary, but he just won't play for the football club. And then it brings me onto the topic of the Mason Greenwood stuff, which I'm not going to talk about because, you know, it's many, it's messy to get involved in. It's not my business. But the Mason Greenwood thing, I think fans should also temper their expectations because it's a domestic dispute. If the young lady decides not to press charges, he could go away scot free. And most likely, considering the nature of their relationship, considering what we've heard on social media, it might be a thing where they're unable to prove whatever they're trying to prove in court. If that's the case, or if there's any sliver of possibility of him walking, there will be a queue of clubs ready to take him. A queue. Even with the news that Nike dropped Mason Greenwood, there will be a queue of sports brands, of clothes or sponsors willing to sign up and get him on board because of the eyes and attention that he'll bring to their brand. And obviously, if you're a football club, because he's still a talented football player, despite what you might think of him as a human, on the football pitch, he's one of the most talented football players, especially young players that we have in Europe, let alone the country. 
So if he gets acquitted in any kind of way, if he doesn't spend any time in jail, he gets a suspended sentence, whatever, he's playing football. And I think this video clip of David Moyes rationalising or basically having no idea what um, uh, perception looks means in this context lets you know everything you know about football in terms of like, they don't really give a shit. So this is David Moyes being asked about Kurt Zuma and why he decided to play a player who had been videoed, you know, kicking a cat across his kitchen. And uh, the club have taken all the actions that they, they can do at the moment and they're, they're you know, working on that behind the scenes. My job is to try and pick a team and pick the best team, which gives me the best chance at West Ham and uh, Kurt was part of that team. Do, do you feel that at any point a, a moral decision comes into picking that team as well, mate? For for me, yeah, because I'm a, a big animal lover, and I. Uh, what does that mean? I'm a big animal lover. That's like saying I'm a big lover of black people. I have black friends. I actually like chicken. I'm a big fan of mango juice. I like hip hop. I like the hippity pop pop pop. Like, what does that mean? I'm a big animal lover. What does that even mean? Just empty platitudes for the sake of it. You know, and I, I think it's something which will have affected a lot of people. So I'm really disappointed with it, but. As I said before, my job tonight was to try and win for West Ham and put the best team out I could to give me that chance. And just finally, you were able to shed any light on the action the club will take? Uh, no, I think the club would rather probably deal with that and I'm sure in time they'll let you know what that action is. No, they won't. Cheers, David. Cheers. Thanks, Jack. Uh, James Cole. David, do you worry it sends the wrong message, the fact that he plays tonight? I don't quite understand your question. Sorry, I don't quite. <laughs> How easy that is, that is that question to answer? Do you think it sends the wrong message that a player that got videoed kicking his cat and chasing it around this kitchen is playing tonight? Considering, you know, he's under investigation. In normal walks of life, you know, you'd probably be suspended upon further investigation. If you found not guilty, you come back to work, no problem. But for whatever reason, because there's football, morality and ethics out of the window. I understand. Uh, if you could explain it to me a little bit better. Well, in any other work, walk of life, you'd be suspended pending an investigation, but he played, and people find that very strange, given what's out there, what's public, what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, as I said earlier, and I'm only <laughs> going to repeat myself, James, that I... Mm, well, I don't give a shit. But yeah, so that's the case, and then in the end, it looks like it's done anyway. RSPCA takes away West Ham's uh, defenders' cats after the video. Kurt Zuma started for West Ham against Watford on Wednesday and less than 24 hours after the video version of him kicking and punching his pet cat. David Moyes said this did not impact his decision to start a defender. So now he's being, um, the cats are being taken away from him. Um, it's a weird one again for me because I've never really been a pet person in general. I was, a, I was the kind of person who would take the piss out of people who cried when their pets died. But over time, as I've matured and got older and you know, hang, being in the company of people with their pets and see how they interact with, with each other and see the love and the warmth and the companionship that they give to people. It does make sense why you would cry when your cat dies or when your dog dies. It does make complete sense. It's not something dumb. Even when people get pet lizards and stuff, do you know what I mean? Being able to have um, a living organism, you know, in your company, especially if you're living alone and stuff, or even with people, it doesn't matter, just in general, it's quite a nice thing. And, you know, it's, it's, it will make complete sense if someone that you felt, if that animal or pet that you had that you built a connection with suddenly passed away, it would make more sense why you get hurt. It's like when you're a kid and you lose your favorite teddy bear. Do you know what I mean? You obviously start bawling your tears out too. You can just buy another one, but there's something special about the one you got there. Same with a pet. You can just get another pet, but, you know, there's nothing like that first bond or that connection that you have with that particular animal that you obviously keep as a pet and whatnot. But I just find it hilarious that how people are treating this way more seriously than they treated any racism issue. It seems like in the space of two days, every sponsor has basically ran away from from him he got dropped by adidas i think v v vitality which is the company that organizes half marathons i think or something like that they dropped they they're not sponsoring west ham anymore which is you know probably no water for ducks back but the adidas one's a big deal for him so he's not sponsored by adidas anymore it's like it's a bit crazy you know what i mean but again the football club in the end are proving us that sometimes footballers get away with murder because they let them get away with murder so it's kind of like a cyclical thing they let them get away with murder because they're good players. The players take liberties. The clubs complain. Um, the fans don't get the you know the best possible product on the pitch because the players aren't really take, giving them shit. You know, everyone suffers. It goes round and round. 
Let's move on from that one. Uh, quickly want to talk about this as well just make it interesting so this is a little um kind of review well yeah this is maybe my general impression which i think might be the only person who thinks this way but i recently saw this collection um from reese cooper featured on vogue and it got me thinking as to how important it is to have the right connections to be co-signed by the right people to have I don't know, whatever it may be. Maybe even be just be a likable person. I don't know what it is. But I find it really weird how this brand, Reese Cooper, which I think is dog dog shit, really, personally. I think it's average as fuck. I think it's a complete waste of materials. And if anything, it doesn't really belong on Vogue at all. It maybe belongs on Hypebeast, but it doesn't belong on Vogue runway. Especially when you consider that this guy was showing this stuff on runways in Paris before the pandemic. Absolutely nuts. But it's a complete waste of fabric, in my opinion. It looks like anything else you'd find on your Instagram discovery page. It's got elements of like engineered garments, Woodwood, and all these other brands that you'd kind of know and love. There's no originality to it. And it just looks a bit bland. I don't really get anything from it at all whatsoever, especially not in terms of a fashion sense. I think when you're presenting, especially when you're presenting within the Paris Fashion Week kind of, you know, milieu, or you're just on Vogue Runway in general, you have to bring your A game. And the reason why I'm talking about it is because I feel like for whatever reason, it gets me annoyed when I see kind of the the difference in kind of reception and how things are received. Because I remember a time when, uh, what's his face? When um, when Kanye first launched his collection. I think that might have been at 2012, that first one that he kind of self-funded. And he, because he loved fashion so much, he was getting involved in it. It was a whole Balmain fear period, the leather joggers period. And he decided to just like take his money and just start a label right? i don't know how how long he was planning it but you know when he presented it on the runway it wasn't the best it was a little bit slapdash but there was something there there was an essence or something you could see okay this guy's got something that you can maybe continue with continue onwards with but the fashion press and media were ruthless with him they were ripping it to pieces calling names saying he doesn't belong there i mean long, I, I remember specifically a review from the um, critic kathy horn who basically said something to paraphrase along the lines of oh just because you're passionate or just because you like clothes doesn't mean you should make it something kind of discouraging like that or disparaging like that and then i'm also sure she was the same critic who really went heavier on kanye when he did that um easy collection outside next to the statue of liberty when all the models are hot and have to drink water and shit and they were fainting right so there was no kind of benefit of the doubt, no patience given to somebody who clearly had way more of a vision in terms of how he was basically trying to present or showcase fashion than what this Reese Cooper has been presenting. What I've seen so far from him has been complete dog shit, in my opinion. And it's just weird how there's not the same level of kind of, I won't say vitriol, but criticism when it comes to this sort of stuff, because obviously, you know, probably introduced to the, probably introduced into the scene by the right people, got the right connections in place. I don't really know. But I just wish there would just be more uniformity and more fairness across the board, across board, yeah? So everybody get the criticism on the same level so that everybody could grow in the same way and they could maybe internalize the criticism and maybe kind of apply it to the stuff that they're doing. And maybe it would just make for a far more harmonious scene in general, I think, because I just don't like the difference in kind of approach because you read this review for this brand and you would never guess it was the brand I'm showing you. For me, I just think it's, you know, basic stuff you could find anywhere, really, from any from any brand, an amalgamation of, of all different types of influences. Again, like I said, it just feels like an Instagram discovery page, kind of copy and paste, no real originality, in my opinion, no real thought. No, no, there is thought gone into it, but no, not, it's not really telling a story. It's not really showcasing anything different. It's just a bog standard, you know, whatever it may be. And does it belong in the, in that calendar or does it belong on Vogue? I don't really think so. And the review is really, really, really flattering considering how basic everything looks. Um, it says here, um, this is talking about him. His POV on fashion started to shift during the pandemic. And after two outdoor shows in Los Angeles, he was certain for 2022 would be his return to Paris Fashion Week. Mais non. Even so, he began designing a collection with the polished traditions of Paris in mind. His plaids, his plaid, sorry, and houndstooth prints are hand drawn in the studio with subtle incorporations of the brand's dear logo hidden in the plates of the pants. Camouflage, a, sap, a staple of his ovure, ovure, sorry, um, is so tonal, um, you might not even realize it's camo. So they're trying to make out like he's some sort of artisan because he, what, sketches a few prints here and there. Nonsense. Um, for the first time, Cooper 
is making tailoring his way a mossy cropped cargo jacket wide leg pants with metal clip details are his versions of a suit he test drove it at the cfda awards last november and he's hoping his customers will experiment with the widest leg pants we've ever made it's just i don't get it i really don't i wish there would be more fairness in the criticism again more power to the kid do your thing whatever it may be i think it's pretty basic and pretty run of the mill i'd rather wear i don't know woodwood or something or even palace even though i fucking hate that brand too but i just think it's dog shit i think everyone should get the same level of criticism but they're not because you know things are different i don't know who cares let's move next one on the list i want to talk about was kiff kiff showcased their spring 2022 menswear collection and much like noah it feels like they've kind of fallen off which is sad to see because I'm a big fan of Kif. I think as a retailer, I think as a brand, I think as a collaborator, they are unparalleled. I think in their ability to, especially the stores, right? Especially the ones around the world, they look incredible, right? Really high attention to detail and the output is just insane. But there's no denying, similar to Noah, they've been, there's been way more misses in Kif of recent years than I've ever seen in the entirety of their brand. Now that could be, because they've grown too fast they're kind of spreading themselves too thin i don't really know but nothing from kiff is hitting like the way it was hitting in the past even their collaborations are a little bit do you know what i mean they're kind of on the they just come and go side of things they're not really rem memorable moments i feel like in sneaker release history or especially when you do your end of year roundups you don't see a lot of people putting kiff releases in their year end roundups anymore maybe because you know they're having issues with getting stock in or whatnot i don't know but still it does feel like they're kind of falling off a little bit and this is another clear example of it because i think this would not look if you told me this was isabel mara like in, in like uh, interpretation of menswear i wouldn't be surprised and the problem with kiff at the moment is that the competition is so like stacked at the moment two brands that come off the top of my head that are doing great things and varying different you know levels stussy of course since they've kind of re-emerged re -emerged in the scene and the other one that's really smashing it is pop trading co you look at those two brands and what they offer in terms of you know button-up shirts down jackets flannels cardigans chinos jeans hats like all the staples that you would kind of think would be in, in needed for have a successful brand especially in men's or in fashion they hit those out of the park every season they'll include a nice little technical jacket or a or a cheeky overcoat or something right really cool stuff in their collection season and season especially stussy like their consistency has been crazy good in the last couple of years or the last few years actually so you're having to compete with those brands on various different levels in terms of like retail price. And then you've got, you know, Kif getting involved. Then you've got ALD doing their thing also and, you know, incredibly overpriced stuff. I just think if you're going to be that brand, you have to really separate yourself from the rest, like Fear of God style and maybe even have like a diffusion line or have the main line be really a cut above most of the stuff that you'd see in regular department stores. But if you think that just by, you could just ride the, co the, the kind of, off the back of the success of your previous years considering the level of combat at the moment i just don't think that's going to happen and i think unfortunately from what we can see so far from kiff here it just looks like a bit of a mess um everything in general like especially these kind of uh, you know print um tracksuit things that he's got at the moment what does that actually look like is that flowers and shit yeah it just doesn't look that great man it looks really dated i'm not going to lie i like this look the best actually it's very human made capital looking style it's basically what is that is that a denim jacket what's that called is that, a, is that a chore jacket i would assume it's more chory than it is a denim jean jacket um it looks fairly cool again giving me kind of japanese vibes because of the um what you call it the the editing on the patches and stuff on the pockets and whatnot and then it looks like they've got a collaboration with hoka Uneone in terms of the shoes there so another interesting collab that's another thing I want to know. If anybody does have information on it, how come Kif get to collaborate with all the sportswear brands, but other stores and brands can't do the same thing? Like sometimes if you work with Adidas or you work with Nike, it basically it ruins your opportunity to work with the competing brand because they might be, you know, they might be a no, a, what's that thing called? A non-competition clause thing. I forgot that name of it called, but basically sometimes if you decide to work for one brand you basically have to decide that's your brand forever there's no real jumping back and forth but for whatever reason kiff are allowed to collaborate with everybody for i mean miss was it um uh, a6 new balance nike i don't think they've done it either just yet they've got the hockey one on a um 
Did they do a thing called with that with that kangaroo brand, uh, Kimo or Kuru, whatever that brand brand? Maybe they have something there. But they've got a lot of collaborations with a lot of different type of um, sportswear brands. And this, I wonder why that's a fact. I wonder why that's the case. Why are they like doing other people aren't? But yeah, in general, the collection's not that great. Like I said before, I think they have fallen off in the same way that Noah's fallen off. Very derivative in terms of the looks. Um, nothing really stands out in terms of wow factor. Maybe some of the shoes, like these wallaby type things are quite nice. That jacket that this lad's got on his looks perfectly decent enough. I guess that might be a five five panel NY hat done in a really classic way. I just, I don't know. I just feel, I, I just don't feel anything from this. You don't really get anything from it whatsoever. This look is really nice. Look number 15, the old black look with the little sweat underneath. That's a very nice jacket there actually. So there, there are some nice pieces here and there. You know, they're not going to not design a nice jacket, especially with these kind of pockets on the outside that everyone's doing at the moment. But in general, like, you know, is that really a look that's worth... Is that really, again, look number 17 with the cardigan and the and the button-up shirt underneath and the bucket hat on and the chinos and these weird shoes. Is that really a look that should... With the gloves on. I don't know if they're gardening gloves or driving gloves. Either way, lose them. Is that really a look that you should be um, running to kit for? If anything, it looks it looks a little bit guy in a park creepy with the bucket hat and the glasses, but it's just not really hitting. Do you know what I mean? That's the problem with it. It's not really hitting as well as it should do. This is nice. Look number 18. That's very nice. You've got this kind of, um, I want to say, would you say quilted? Padded? Sort of coach jacket style thing going on there. I think that's nice. The combat pants are really nice. That's maybe the best look I've seen out of, the, out of everything, to be honest. I like that look, number 18. But the rest of it is like a bit boring. I'm not going to lie. And maybe it doesn't help too that they've got this model modeling it too he looks he looks a little bit like a fuck boy in it maybe that's the fact too him preening and looking at you with his johnny bravo dimple on his chin maybe that's the fact that's not helping the i don't know he looks cool in the clothes don't get me wrong he looks cool but maybe the fact of his face and whatnot and his poses is not really making it hit the same but i don't think so i just think the clothes aren't that great um you know that yeah that that jacket with those combat pants or those kind of pants styles um is probably the best thing i've seen so far in this collection hands down and that's not even, again, is it something to run to Kif to? Like, come on, man. This is a quintessential festival look, isn't it? It looks like he's designing for kids that are going to go to Glastonbury. Bucket hat, um, shell jacket, side um, side bag, nondescript shorts with pockets near to stick all your cat and your 2CB in, long white socks and trainers. It's typical. Those trainers actually look a little bit like mixes of Harachis, don't they, a little bit? They've got some Harachi kind of esque feel to them, but. Yeah, or maybe um, Arivi Derchi's, the ETGs with the sock liner on there, maybe. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, man. Oh, this is a nice look again. There's some good looks in it. Some good looks. There's probably, what have I counted so far? Five good looks, maybe three Pacific items that I would actually have in my wardrobe. But apart from that, it's a bit, a bit sad. Come on, man. You can't be wearing I love ABC top and bottom like this, man. Yeah, it's not the best for me. Personally, I, I don't really rate it too tough. I don't think it's that amazing. I think it's a little bit mediocre. Is that a collaboration with um, with with uh, Salomon? That'd be interesting. If they end up doing that, so yeah, many, many, many things. Maybe it's a. I mean, you know what? It actually reminds me of a little bit. It reminds me of um, it reminds me of kind of garb that you would see somebody from um, what's that label called? Kind of music. This looks like something that Adam Port would wear. This entire. This is like an Adam Port wardrobe. And um, Riznik or whatever his name is, right? This is like a kind of music wardrobe, head to toe kind of music shit. Maybe that's who did this. Maybe that's his muse, isn't it? But yeah, you can't be wearing an I love ABC hoodie. But yeah, this is nice look as well. The end one, but overall, a little bit disappointed from Kif. Unfortunately, it looks like they have fallen off. Um, I guess it happens to most brands, isn't it? You don't stay at the top forever. It is what it is, I guess, isn't it? It is what it is. Next on the list, I wanted to quickly mention these. I don't really know much about the artist. It's called uh, Tyrell, Tyrell or Tyrell Winston. Shows off his up and coming Reebok Club C collaboration. And if you're not familiar with the Club C model, that's the model that's kind of made famous or popularized by Jound. I think that might have been his first official footwear collab, if I'm not mistaken. They were pretty popular. And I don't understand why, because I see these Club Cs and I just look, I just think they are dead. And I was just thinking now, actually, are these like the quintessential Caucasian male shoe? This look like the kind of shoe that, you know, if you're the kind of guy who rolls up his own cigarettes, 
who wears white socks with his trainers, who puts on the beanie right at the top of his head, who either smells like piss or smells like Tom Ford, who rides his bike everywhere, um, who likes to spend time in flipping Hackney down, just chilling on his own, um, who goes record shopping but doesn't buy any records, right? <laughs> that, that's a, this is what they kind of look like they really look like that like you run your design agency from your laptop that's that kind of points outside your window you're employed by you know what i mean like you never file your invoices on time but you always complain about getting back being paid late that's what they look like they look like the quintessential white creative hipster shoe because i don't think i've ever seen anyone else wear them because they're so butters because i when i think of white sneakers there's not many that i would wear and considering what they look like why would I choose a Club C over a classic Air Force One in terms of shape? Like, this shape is terrible, I feel like. It's got this weird, spoony, U-E type of shape at the bottom. Um, there's too many panels on it for what it is. It's pretty low-profile sneaker. It's got way too many paneling details, I feel like. And it's got this other weird thing, too, where it's kind of sleek at the front of the toe box here. It's pretty sleek. You know, it's got a pretty um, narrow, what's it, short or small mud guard right so it's not the biggest shoe but then for every reason on the top towards where you put your foot in next to the tongue and the eyelets it kind of bulbs out so it's kind of the opposite of a jordan too low a jordan too low i feel like it's sort of like chunky but it's like chunky all the way through whereas this kind of has that fat thing at the top but then it kind of slivets or goes a bit slim towards the front which obviously doesn't help with someone like me who's got wide feet and in general doesn't look very sleek when you're wearing them because it's the kind of shoe that should be wearable with a tux or a suit or a tailored trouser or a pleated trouser. But in actuality, when you try and put them on and try and make it work and try and freak it, it looks terrible. From what I can see, it, could, it would look terrible unless you were somebody that was, you know, imagine you're my height, you're six foot, but you're blessed with size eight feet. I mean, you're going to look banging in these because size eight feet in most trainers when you're tall is always going to look great. But when you're my size foot, like a UK 10, sometimes 10 and a half, these are going to look like absolute boats. And then it got me thinking about Reeboks that I actually mess with because I think Reeboks in general are a waste of time. Um, what's the point of buying any of these shoes if you just go and buy another? Like, I'd much rather buy a pair of Deodoras than they go for a Reebok. And I thought to myself, oh, you know what? Only Reebok can actually wear. Or I would consider wearing would be the Reebok Classic. But I can't because of the area that I grew up in. The connotation of Reebok Classics are always to do with, you know, far right flipping extremist guys and, you know, national front dudes and skinners and all that malarkey. All those guys were the ones that used to wear Reebok Classics and they chase you around the hood wearing these things and kicking you and stuff and throwing stuff at you and whatnot and trying to chase your mum down the street. Like mad shit. Kind of big up all my friends who grew up in the custom house canning town area. You know what I'm talking about, right? Mad as well because most of those guys always had, you know, daughters that had flipping mixed race kids like it's always a common thing that happened which might explain why they hate you so much but that's the reason that's where i remember reboot classics and then the one i also remember are, are these the work reboot workouts with the icy blue soul and i remember those because one time back in the day ages ago when i was really young i remember bumping or walk bumping into or walk or yeah crossing paths with wiley um, I think it was maybe in Bo or somewhere around there. And you had a pair of these Reebok workouts on with the icy blue sole, but you had those with the kind of shark tooth sole or something, like jagged sole. And they looked so good. I'm not sure if it's called jaggy. So what's it called? Icy sole. Uh, what's it called again? Let's just say jagged, jagged sole. Oh, there we go. I yeah, found them. Yeah, these are the ones, aren't they? Are they the ones? Yeah, those are the ones I saw Wiley wearing. Yeah, these ones. They were so good up like in clo and again this is back in the day they were so expensive to purchase these like Reeboks were really a lot of money like a hundred like more than a hundred which is crazy because number one my parents were never going to buy me shoes more than a hundred pounds and it was just crazy that you would spend a hundred you know more than a hundred pounds on Reeboks when you just get a pair of TNs or a pair of Air Max 95s or whatnot it just didn't make any sense um so Reebok kind of missed the mark on that one and I kind of feel bad for Reebok too because they've clearly got a lot of stuff in their archives they're trying to you know debut new shoes and you know basically give updated versions of the classics and whatnot but people just want the classics i remember one time when i used to work for nike that being a thing when we used to talk to people because i remember were they owned by nike were Reebok owned by nike at the time i don't know what happened but we had we had a lot of communication with people that worked at Reebok at the time and i remember um one of the guys that was in charge of the marketing or the seeding being really frustrated working there because he basically said that it's really hard to try and 
introduce new shoes to the market especially to like influencers and whatnot because whenever they have conversations with them and they sit down with them and they talk about the brand the first thing they always mention are Reebok workouts or Reebok classics none of them care about whatever new model they're trying to you know get some i get some research on or crowdsource they don't care they want to either see the work the 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 workout or the reebok classic they don't care about the new model they're trying to bring out they don't care about it at all and it must be super frustrating for them in that regard which might explain why margella decided to do their sort of tabby toe thing with the reebok classic instead of making it in some new model or whatnot but yeah um Big up that guy anyway, whatever he's, what's his name? Uh, let me get up on here again, again. Is it this one? Yeah, big up uh, Tyrrell Winston anyway. I'm not familiar with the guy. I think he's an artist, yeah, a multimedia artist, widely known for his engineering pieces that centered around sports fan fanaticism, mostly known for his creating unique grids from used or deflated basketball. The New York-based New York artist is now embarking on a new creative venture. It's interesting though, isn't it, right? This guy is the one that did this, obviously in the background of this shoot. But he's the one that made this very plain F, very plain shoe. I wonder why. Maybe because he's in the studio all the time. You would imagine someone that makes artwork like that would be making shoes that look so plain like this, isn't it? But again, big up him. I won't be wearing them because I fucking hate Reebok, but big up him regardless. Moving on from that. Uh, what else we want to talk about here? What did I think was of interest here? Did I save it here? yeah let's talk about this this is quite cool so this is courtesy of high snobiety and it features justin bieber in a new balenciaga campaign wearing a hoodie that looks like it's too small for him or it's been tailored in a way to come up that short on his wrist i'm not too sure but the one standout thing i thought about this campaign apart from justin bieber looking very handsome is the balenciaga triple s's the ones that i had that unfortunately i had to bin because the soul completely crumbled another another casualty of flipping covid right what happened was that i had them in a box and i guess i was wearing them i didn't realize how often i was wearing them because i was kind of you know i'll take them out um periodically here or there when i was going out raving but unfortunately because they're a size 44 and my right left foot is kind of bigger than my right and I, he probably needed to get a 45, but they would have been too big. I don't really know, but they were a little bit too small. So I didn't wear them often. Too, I didn't wear them too much, but I also did wear them once every two months or something. So I guess because of that, I didn't notice that you needed to keep a gel pack in the shoe because I was wearing them every once or two months. So now because of the lockdown, and because of pandemic, there were time where I just wouldn't wear anything apart from house slippers and, you know, Air Force Ones. I then finally went to open the box and take them out one night and the soles were legitimately crumbling in my hands crumbling and it was all sticky and stuff like i was like oh no i had to throw i had to bend them i could have got probably one more use out of them that night but i didn't want to be the guy in the club like walking around with like shoes with no soles on them and all crumbling because you know you know that that would have been a bad look but that aside the triple s i found I'm not sure if everyone else has a pair are legitimately one of the hardest shoes to wear in an outfit like because they're so gigantic like you know of course the whole point like triple soles mesh meld together with that massive upper there's no flex on them whatsoever and they legitimately feels like bricks but it's not cool there's not a good way to wear them you know what i mean and then now i'm seeing this campaign picture of justin in these really oversized jeans without covering the entire shoe it's now making me feel this is what i should have done when i had mine which is now making me feel like I should go and purchase another pair of these because they're classics. And I know they're Marmite shoes and many people didn't like them, um, which was beneficial for me because they were easier to buy. But I legitimately liked them. I wore them a lot when I had them, really, really a lot. I wore them on holiday. I wore them going out. I wore them to work until, unfortunately, my feet started to expand and, you know, I couldn't kind of fit into them on a daily basis anymore. But I'm definitely going to end up getting them another pair. Uh, like I said uh, before, the last one I got was a 44. This time I'll definitely get a 45. And I'll definitely try and freak it with a pair of oversized, um, light pair of denim like this. Usually with black shoes, I tend to go with darker denim. But I do like the kind of combination with the black hoodie and the light jeans. That does quite look quite cool. And these particular jeans with this massive hole in the size does remind me of a pair of jeans. I remember them wearing day to day when he used to wear his New Rock boots. So maybe this is something he's kind of pulled from his own archives. But Justin looks really cool. I'm not going to lie. Here's him, him in the studio chilling. Is that a belt they've made? That's pretty cool if they made like a belt. Is that like similar to what Virgil made in his collection? I don't know if that is. Or that's just like a standard thing. But he's in the studio chilling, doing his thing. And yeah, those are the, they're the triple S's. Like such a Marmite shoe, man. But it's funny because at the time, these were considered really ugly. 
maybe still people think they're ugly now, but considering what we have on the market, these look pretty basic. They look pretty normal. They just look like a standard athletic trainer with like an extra sole on the bottom. Especially considering the other shoes that Balenciaga are due to bring out, right? Um, they've got that one shoe that I'm a real big fan of. Let me see if I can get it up on here. Uh, they've got that one shoe that I really, really want. Balenciaga. Is it tire sneaker? Let's see. I think it's a tire sneaker. It's a new one. It's just come out. Tire. Let's see if it is a tire sneaker. It's got like a really bulbous sole on the bottom. Where is it? Uh, where is this? It's like a tire sneaker thing. Is it a tire sneaker? It's like from the new collection. Where is it? Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, even these look these these ones here. The was it the round? I don't know what that one is, but the style. But this one even looks way more crazy than the triple S's in terms of how it's constructed and whatnot. But it's a shoe that they've got at the moment. It's like a tire. It's like a wheel. Oh, the toe. Balenciaga tire sneaker. My bad. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, that's the one. So they've got this one coming out, which looks even more wild compared to the one that I had, the Triple S. This looks flipping nuts. But I love, oh yeah, I want, I love these two, the Crocs. But these look crazy, innit? Compared to the other ones. So it's to, in case you're not um, watching the show, it's basically a new uh, Balenciaga sneaker. I think from spring, summer, maybe it's from fall actually, and it's basically in an athletic shoe that's encased in a tire. Basically, picture that. That's what it essentially looks like. I'm not sure if it's if it's like a thicker sole, or if it's like deceptively thick, where it's kind of the shoe kind of sits in and then the tire kind of overlaps on the outside. I'm not really too sure. It looks like a bike tire too, doesn't it? It doesn't look like a tread of a car tire maybe it is a car tire i'm not really sure but it is really interesting looking shoe in it i'd love to wear a pair of these so yeah let's see what happens let's see what happens in it small steps small bloody steps next on the list we have what do we have here we don't talk about that because that's boring same old same more so let's just move here yeah this is a good one to talk about so this is courtesy of photos of yay which is a twitter account that posts loads of photos of yay and obviously stuff that he's done on instagram posts and stuff that if you're not following day to day you can just get all that stuff on there and anything concerning people around him and obviously in the in the run-up to dunder 2 this account's been posting many many things that i've been thankful for because i would never have found them or saw them myself in terms of people he's in the studio with just him running around the normal stuff and um they reposted this uh screenshot that Kanye took and uploaded on his own account I'm not sure if he's deleting at the moment that I think kind of speaks to the issues I've always had with people on the scene when it comes to streetwear fashion whatever scene I'm involved in and maybe also speaks to the reason why I've never really been super successful in that field in terms of pursuing my career there or basically getting myself in a position to get paid to do the stuff that those guys are doing because I wasn't willing to kind of do these kind of funny style games or to have zero lack of self-awareness no shame that would kind of I feel like are usually um, really important parts that you need to have in your arsenal if you want to go and pursue those careers in those fields because the market you know there's so, there's basically too many people that want jobs in that industry and none of jobs to go around so if you want to differentiate yourself you're going to need to be able to kind of get on your knees and suck a bit of dick you know what i mean it just is what it is it's painful but it is so this is Kirsty of photos with yay and it's a repost that says him basically posting screenshots that he's basically having an sms message with somebody right back and forth and the caption of the post goes as follows this is an example of kim's cousin agreeing with me about tiktok then proceeding to ask me for some yeezys afterwards her other cousin Kara, called me saying she agreed with me then said she would speak out she would speak out publicly which she never said she did um what she suggested right so this is again so we get, get on the first um screenshot is somebody messaging Kanye saying as follows hi how are you hope all is well with you and the kids I saw your post on Instagram about TikTok and your daughter I'm happy to share what I have know about this since I am the single mom and want to keep my kids off internet too call me or let me know if you want some information hope to see you all soon and Kanye texts back I don't feel like talking about it more cool no problem the next screenshot we've got um i don't maybe it's a carrying on it's a dragged into a dark place world uh, now my kids are getting dragged in she says i'm sorry i didn't mean to upset you he said i'm not upset and she said is it safe to buy yeezys on stock x 
<laughs> oh my god right so she starts off with this mad long message talking about you know she saw his post and she connects with him as a, she does that whole thing that people always do as a mother as a black woman as a black man as a person of color as a queer person as a gay man everyone does that thing where they wear their identity on their sleeves on their chest they flipping have it on the front of their hat gay man straight man handicapped man um visually impaired man dyslexic like it's like relax no one cares no one cares are you a good person yay or nay what's the strength of your actual character not this thing that you're born with right do you know what i mean that you didn't have any choice in that's not important we all have things that we have to kind of overcome in life no one cares about that are you a truthful person are you somebody somebody are you a loyal person are you a loving person are you a caring person do you, do you know what i mean those are the things that are actually important not the fact that you're a single mother who cares especially a single mother in the valley like really are you are all single mothers who cre create the same i don't think so but you know again i'm a dude i can't comment so we move on I'm happy to share what I know. <laughs> so instead of just sharing with it then, like being, hey, I know you're going through a tough situation now. You don't need to reply to me, but here's the loads of resources that I kind of use at the time when I was going through a tough time with my kid on social media. And if you ever need me, call me. Like that's what you do if you're really being selfless and wanting to be someone's friend. But when you see everybody as a transaction, when you see everybody as a clout token, every interaction is a game of clout. You're trying to basically see, oh, where's the in? How can I get the thing that I want? How can I curry favor here? How can I um, illustrate that I'm a good person here so I can get something there? Nothing is real. It's all fake. It's all inauthentic, which again explains why I think I suffered and wasn't successful in that industry because I was incapable, unwilling, or just didn't have any idea that this is how the game is played. Because what we're seeing here is Kanye, at his grown age, texting with a woman who's also in her grown age, doing the same games that I was subjected to or I saw my friends doing when I was like 17, 18, 19. They were doing exactly the same things back then. So what it shows me is that it's still the same thing going on now, which also maybe explains why Kanye is such a monster. Like why he's such a flipping divisive figure, why he doesn't seem to um, have any level of, um, I would say temperance, but... There's no kind of self-reflection. It's just like everything that he does, he does it and he justifies it after the fact because he just, you know, he just can't justify it and bulldoze his way through. And now that he's made money, he's essentially turned into somebody you can never give feedback to because once he's been validated in the real world in terms of, okay, cool, I'm a billionaire now. You can't tell me shit. You basically create a monster that's incapable of, you know, having anyone give him any words of advice because in his head, it's like, who are you, who are you talking to? But also, I feel like his friends around him have empowered him because, why? He's so beneficial to them that they would much rather turn a blind eye to the stuff that he does that they don't like in order to get the favours that they want. That's what they do, which kind of explains why you see all these, you know, big friends around him when he's making the album and the whole of hip-hop kind of turns out and decides to join him in recording the album. I've not seen anybody come out and say he has a stance for him supporting Trump. I'm not going to record with him. Everyone basically has forgotten about him wearing the red hat. They've forgotten about him calling Trump his stepdad and they've decided, yeah, he's my boy now because he's so good at what he does and he's such a genius at what he does. People are willing to turn a blind eye, but it's also created a monster that he is at the moment. But anyway, going back to this issue, this illustrates to me why, again, I felt like I didn't succeed in the scene or I didn't get as further as I probably should have or as my talent should have got me to, considering where other people that I know have got to. This is the reason why, because I couldn't do this stuff, because I just incapable of subjecting myself to kind of asking someone for a favor, number one especially somebody who I feel like I want to be a peer of in that scene. Somebody who I kind of want to work alongside with in the future. I don't want to be subservient to you, especially in the beginning. At least let me prove my worth that I'm an actual creative too, that I've got cool ideas as well, that I can kind of spar with you in the same sort of flipping um, coliseum. At least let's do that. I don't want to come into it being the big friend. That's ridiculous. And also, I'd much rather if I was friends with someone like a Kanye, why not be an actual friend to the person instead of being somebody that's going to try and extract value? Why not try and be that one person in his social group that he can maybe go to that's actually going to give him an unbiased opinion because you generally don't need anything from him. You're not trying to get a record deal. You're not trying to get a loan to start a brand. You're not trying to get free Yeezys. You don't want tickets to go to a concert. And again, even, even if I was going to ask for something, even if I was, which I never would, because I'm never a favor guy. I'd much rather starve and go homeless, ask anybody for a favor. But even if I was going to be that guy, 
what would you rather do? Ask Kanye for some Yeezys that you could easily buy yourself. It's not Yeezys. This is not like Yeezys when they came out in like 2017 or something. This is Yeezys in 2022. You can buy those things for like a hundred pound more of over retail and StockX. It, when they drop on a certain day, they give you loads of notice ahead of time. You can buy them pretty easy on the website. Easy supply when they do drop. Like simple. You don't need a bot or anything. Like as long as you're there within a 10 minute window of them releasing, you can generally get most pairs of Yeezys. It's not that difficult. So to go to this extent, just for some Yeezys is really, really R-worded. Completely. Especially considering this is a grown woman, a single mother, because she said it herself. This is a single mother begging for free shoes in the midst of this man going through a very public divorce, a very public custody battle, it seems like, and just loads of like, you know, back and forth tension, family stuff. And this is the time you feel like it's a, this is the appropriate time you think to slip in and ask for some free Yeezys. Come on, man. It continues, says, um, the, the, yeah, so this is it. <laughs> With some free leagues. Is it safe to buy you just some StockX? Andrew wants the Belugas. We love to see you and kids. <laughs> and he says the next one, his next text is, don't ask me about Yeezys right now absolutely crazy isn't it absolutely crazy how people are man like yeezys in the midst of me flipping fighting you know for to see my children and fighting to change the perception of me being a deadbeat dad and stuff you are asking me for fucking yeezys like these people are absolutely insane man legitimately insane people i don't really know what's wrong with them um but again maybe i maybe i don't know what's wrong with me maybe i don't know what's wrong with me Next on the list, and maybe we'll end it here. We've got this quick I wanted to mention. Um, I was talking about Kif earlier on and how I feel like they've kind of fallen off. Another brand I feel like has fallen off, and this could be explained a little bit. Maybe this could be explained more because of what's happened with Brendan, but this is Noah's new Spring Summer 22 lookbook and collection. And I think the reason why this might have fallen off might have something to do with the fact that Noah is now no, sorry, Brendan Babson, the founder of Noah, is now the creative director of J. Crew. You know, J. Crew, you know, we all know the history of J. Crew and how it came up and basically the the importance and influence it had in menswear slash streetwear back in the day. And it kind of went for a bit of a lull period, but they're trying to basically reinvigorate the brand. And what better way to do it again than tapping into streetwear? Because again, if you know Brendan's um, background, he was obviously a former designer at um, Supreme. He also started Noah there. It was a bit, it went dormant for a bit. Then when he left Supreme, he then started Noah on his own. And some people, myself, I would say, some people, me personally would say, the greatest era of Supreme was when um, no, was when Brendan Babson was still there. And as soon as he left, the quality of the outerwear, especially, I feel like, and the overabundance of the logos and whatnot went up considerably. Maybe that might have to do with the VF Corp um, investment in terms of, you know, maybe tapping into newer markets because it suddenly went from having the Supreme logo on a little red tab on sometimes on the underside of it, not even in the front side. Now suddenly everything's got Supreme Britain on the on the sleeve, on the hood, on the back of the bums, on shorts. Like it's everywhere. Before it was never like that. It was always very subtly done. And I feel like you know, especially the outerwear, the jackets were. I think of some. I think of this. I think this was something that Noah, sorry, Brendan must have been at Supreme with when it was a design or something he designed himself. What is it called again? I had it. Is it Aston? Was it Anorak? Is it Anorak? Oh, what is it called, man? patchwork was it called i had it as well was it fucking called was it called anorak not anorak uh parker is it supreme parker i've got the name of it what it's called is it 2017 when was it no it's not 2017 maybe it was 2011 it's not that either maybe it was 2010 what was that parker that i had the one with aaron bond or off war was half and half Maybe that was a time when uh, Noah was still, uh, sorry, Brenda was still at Supreme. I'm pretty sure. But basically all this kind of outwear sort of stuff, you know, a little bit more simple, a little bit more classic. Those are the times that I remember. Let's see if I can do 2009. When was it? Yeah, this is the one. So I had this. Uh, this reminds me of the best era of Supreme outerwear when they had these sort of parkers, right? And I feel like Brenda was still at Supreme at the time when these stuff were being made, especially this, like this is definitely a grail, especially the red one in the middle there, this um, Supreme, what's it called, down jacket, right? Really nice. I had this one there. I had that color actually, this one right here. And I had the, I had this blue and green too, but I sold it. I didn't wear it, but I wore that this color day in, day out 
I think I remember seeing um, there was an action editorial of Andrew Aaron Bond off a former and York thing fame wearing this pair. But again, like, you know, a very subtle touch with the bread. And again, that was maybe a, a bit extreme. Back in the day, that would have been tonal. But that red box, that was it. And I remember back in the day, some guys that used to buy Supreme, especially guys from like Super Future, if the logo was too obtuse like this, they would sometimes clip it off. They would take the logo off. Imagine that. Kids nowadays would never do that because that would basically ruin the value of your stuff, especially if you want to resell it. But that was a big thing back in the day. Is this a Justice for All um, Parker too? I think that might be it. But yeah, there was a good time. I think that was one of the guys that used to work at Supreme. I forgot his name. But yeah, a good time to be alive back then, right? And I guess the other one must have been 28, 2008. The one that had the patch on the sleeve. Oh, that's another one too. That's that's another one too that reminds me of Brendan Babson's era at Supreme. I'm pretty sure he designed that. I think so. I, th I hope he did. I hope I'm not just chatting out my ass as per usual, but I think he might have designed that also. Uh, what was it, man? It had the little patch. Was it 2007? Let me see if it was 2007. Uh, no, it wasn't 2007. Was it? Uh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I had this one too, but the other colorway. I had it in the red. I think the red, the red and the navy. So that one. Yeah, that's the one I had. This one. Yes, respect the wild. Oh, I had this jacket, man. Crazy. I used to wear this all the time. What's it going for at the moment, actually, in terms of money, price-wise? I forgot how much I sold mine for. 3.15. Minor, innit? Oh, it's a size small, that's why. But yeah, back in the day, Supreme was the best, man. I don't care. But yeah, so anyway, it feels like um, Noah's suffered a little bit because, you know, it seems like he's, maybe his commitments have been spread and he's now at um, J. Crew. The, look, the best look that I've seen in this entire collection so far, I think, has been this look here. Um, the first one in the lookbook, which is essentially a brown suede tassel jacket um, with some nice denim and white socks and some great loafers. I like the socks especially because they don't bunch. Little detail there. I'm not sure if they're that's like a stylist trick or whether or not he's constructed a pair of socks that don't bunch. It's hard to do. Even Nike socks that you buy sometimes, they, they're too long. You have to pull them down to bunch them up at the bottom. I just want socks that are white socks that are perfect, that kind of end right underneath your calf muscle. That's all I want. Not much, you know what I mean? But the, the cut of the jeans is really good. That tassel leather um, or suede jacket looks really cool too. But the rest of it is a bit forgetful. It's a bit forgettable. And considering, again, the competition out there at the moment in terms of brands that do stuff similar in this sort of space, I don't know if it's, you can justify spending the Noah money that you would need to buy these things. Nothing really jumps off the screen that is kind of a must cop out of everything that's in there. Some of the shoes are horrible. They've got this Popeye's jacket that looks fairly interesting, I think, for the most part. Some of the knits are nice. Again, this look maybe with those bowling shoes is a bit better, but overall, it's never, it's not anything that really would want you to go out of your way to go and purchase personally. I wouldn't think so anyway nothing here that I really was crying out in that regard this is maybe one of the better looks as well towards the end but yeah Noah's kind of fallen off I feel like a little bit it has a little bit personally for me I'm not too sure if anyone else would agree and then to end it we have maybe a reason or rationale why it's fallen off because this guy called Derek Guy shared some pictures from J. Crew Spring Summer 2020 um, styling courtesy of Brendan, but obviously he's obviously um, the creative director there, J. Crew. This might explain why the source has left Noah because it seems like he's taken that source and it, you know exported it over to J. Crew. This is one of the this look itself with these shorts and this um, polo long sleeve and the loafers look far better than anything we just saw in the Noah collection. This one look itself, so clearly. That's where maybe his creative juices are now being um, dispersed around or whatnot, right? J. Crew are basically sitting there open mouthed, ready to have, uh, you know, uh, Brendan Babijan's design expertise dunked into their mouths. So maybe this is a factor. Right? But I haven't seen anything more from it. I don't know if there's going to be more looks from the lookbook released. But overall, fairly decent, isn't it? Fairly, fairly decent. But yeah, that's been the Exxon Zing Show episode number 554. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time tuning into the show via YouTube and all that stuff, you know what to do. Like, smash, and all that stuff. If you listen via the podcast app, smash the like. No, well, leave me a review, actually. Share it. That would be greatly appreciated. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome too. Link you can find in the description. There's also a contact me link there in the description too because I've got a URL for the show, which is actually no Zinger Show, all one word.com. So if you want to contact me, you can. There's a button in the top right-hand corner called Contact 
subscribe but i've also got the link in the description of this show if you're listening to it you can press that and if you want to send me an email it'll get over to me and i'll reply promptly but yeah thanks again for listening it's been a pleasure to have your company if you listen to the audio podcast as always you'll hear a tune and if you're watching this on youtube it'll just end right here